Hello dear students today we are going to critically appreciate the poem Delhi written by R Parth Sarathi R Parth Sarathi is one of the indian writers writing in english and his name can be teamed up with writers like Ezekiel Mahapatra and Ramanujan he is also the writer with a modern bent of mind and uh, that's why when he is writing he has got all these modern man's dilemma which can be reflected in the way he expresses his poems similar kind of vein is also undercurrent in the poem that we are going to study closely today that is delhi and here in this poem he talks about delhi which is of course the capital of india and an important place for all the historical events that took place and how these events have shaped us indians in this present day and the monuments of esteemed value that we see in and around delhi are basically according to him some kind of burden from the past because whenever you will move around your head the monuments uh, proclaim to be the masterpieces of the rulers who ruled india and plundered india actually and uh, were the symbols of power and colonial suppression to the people of india so whenever you turn your head you will find tughlaqs khiljis lodhis moguls and colonial british empires residues which are to be found in and around the place and that's why he claims to revive back indraprastha he claims to revive back the indian civilization that was earlier and uh, the real roots basically is called upon where one should return so uh, apart from all these things one more thing that i would like to add upon is that uh, all these writers all the modern writers in writing in indian uh, context who are indian writers in english are dealing with the places the subject matter of the places where they have been where they have lived where they have grown up and how it is uh, reflected through through their critical eye because they are not writing like some romantics beautifully uh, explaining the beauty of the place in an exalted way so you see uh, be it ramanujan or be it ezekiel when he talks about in his poem island about bombay or when it is mahapatra when he talks about puri in his poem dawn at puri and when parth sarathi talks about delhi in this particular poem they all are having a critical eye towards the place so this is very important and very significant to parallel all these writers and then have a close view to all these poems and that's why i have made separate videos on all these poems and poets that i have mentioned you can go and find out in the playlist uh, in the youtube channel and uh, as for now coming to the poem itself here we will start up with the technical details and the close reading of the poetry but before that a little overview of the poet so r parth sarathi a poet a critic an editor and a translator so a versatile genius and one of the modern writers who is writing in english an indian writer writing in english so we can categorize him to the wing of indian writing in english and uh, again i have already told you that he can be clubbed with writers like ezekiel and mahapatra he was born in 1934 and one of his major works is rough passage written by him so moving on to the particular poem that we are going to read today delhi which is of much significance because he is bringing back all the burdens of the past of india 
and indianness as a whole which we have carried on our shoulders for long ages where people have come to india they have plundered india they have subjugated the people living here and have left their marks on the very backs of all the indian civilization and delhi is one of the places which reflects it in its all core because uh, being the capital it was the most affected place one can say so let's start with line by line analysis of the poetry so as you can see the lines are not in any fixed rhythmical pattern or any fixed metrical composition the free verse is all together and the stanzas are also not equally distributed 3 3 then we have like six stanzas and all those things so we can say that it's not a poem with lot of structure as we will see but the structure in itself is and this is again a technicality of the modern writers but yeah the structure in itself is that uh, it talks about the historical development of delhi and that's why um, that is the very basic structure that we have to keep in mind the ochre air irritates the tongue dust thickens it the squalid city groans under the loo familiar on an ordinary afternoon in may it's a symmetry of stones so what he's saying it's like the place delhi when he describes delhi he is calling it like a symmetry of stones so there are so many buildings the buildings which signify death buildings which signify there are so many tombstones actually made in delhi so all these tombstones of various rulers and their wives and brides they all signify that delhi has been converted into the death bed it's like a cemetery full of stones and again you see a very um, you can say grotesque um, comparison of a place like delhi where uh, he is talking about uh, the ochre air the yellow color air ochre is the color of yellow pale yellow which is irritating the tongue so there is dust all over the place the pollution of delhi in the modern era plus because the dust from the past have been on our shoulders and on our faces all around so it is sticking to us it's thickening and the city is groaning with pain and because it is the may time that he is talking about so he is saying that it is a familiar incident at the time of may under the influence of flu because delhi can be very hot in summers so in the summers when delhi is very hot the city is full of dust one of the pollution levels of delhi that he is talking about which is increasing day by day dust can settle all over you the color of the air which you will see around you is ochre and it is very irritating to the eyes to the tongues and delhi is nothing but a cemetery of stones a death bed a place full of tombstones i see everywhere khiljis tughlaqs lodhis moguls they stick to its face like toads when ghazni knocked or was it clive question mark we paid off old scores in our backyards so again he is talking about the people or the dynasties which have ruled here which have left their mark on the paths of delhi be it the lodhis the tughlaqs the khiljis or the moguls and whatever they have done their dust is still sticking to our face and not only them he is also talking about clive question mark so of course the british empire and their rule that cannot be forgotten of so we paid off for whatever they did that we paid at our own cost the indians paid for it 
the uh, indians which he is referring to is the ancient indian civilization that he is talking about and uh, then he counts the years for how much time all these outside invaders have been invading india 800 years of bloodletting has made inanks of us once for all unsettled our minds so for 800 years it has been the series of events where people have been coming where outward invaders have been coming and invading india and subjugating us and suppressing us and that has made us like inanks we are impotent now we are unable to uh, brew any kind of creativity and it is not only around us in a physical form that we can see but it is also in our minds that we have been shunned out of creativity we have become impotent we have become inanks it is settled in our mind because we all see that subjugation of the mind is the most important because when one has to conquer some one or somebody first thing they do is the subjugation of the mind like the colonial people did like the britishers did while subjugating indians they made us forget our past they made us forget our civilization they made us forget our ancient rich heritage and culture so what we have done we have become inanks we have become impotent now atop himalaya uncertainty grins so himalaya is not that strong towering uh, you can say the um, crown of india but it is full of uncertainty it is grinning an ominous skull the sun the skull uh, sun is compared to the skull it is a metaphor for uh, skull is used as a metaphor for sun and where sun always signifies ray light and ray of hope and light and uh, uh, something new a new dawn a new creativity here sun is being compared to skull so the rising of the sun from behind the himalayas every day is bringing no kind of hope but it's grinning down at us it's smiling in a very uh, grim way towards us saying that uh, what you all have become where has that indian civilization the rich indian heritage and culture gone so it is very ominous it is ominous is of course something which is uh, not uh, healthy or something which is uh, not of good luck so here the sun and the himalayas are signifying that it is himalayas is not any more the significance that it held earlier it is not any more the uh, protector um, as we can say of uh, indian civilization and the symbol of indian um, wealth and culture but himalaya is now uh, just like uh, some kind of bad luck from where the sun is rising and uh, time rests its hand on my shoulder old i look every illusion in the face my fingers are stiff i can't write even two lines letters come in from all sides i lay them aside the days collapse on the pile the hands that wrote them so he's saying that now he is also becoming old as a writer when he's trying to write there are so many things that is coming to his mind but he is unable to pen them down the words are coming and he is piling them off from one pile to another but he is unable to jot them down he is unable to comprehend in th- his thoughts in such a sequential manner that he will be able to pen it down completely now see all these lines till now are signifying all the modernistic approaches towards writing you will see so many modern writers when they are writing be it ted hughes in his thought fox or be it uh, in to in campagna when the author is uh, losing sight of what he is trying to write in the same way here um, just like any modern writer words are coming to him but he is not able to pen them down precisely and then again uh, from the very starting of the lines when he talks about the ochre air and all you can see that there is quite a striking resemblance with iliad 
when Eliot writes in his proof rock song, uh, like a patient authorized upon the table when he describes the atmosphere of the modern era. Uh, similar kind of resemblance is seen here in this poetry also. And then uh, he is talking about he being old, he being not able to compose his fingers, he being not able to write down even two lines, although there are inflow of letters from all sides, although there are so many thoughts in his mind, but to comprehend them, to bring them to one vein is very difficult. So, in the very next line he says, Return at leisure to knock on my inexpectant door of Churiwala, the present is troubled. So he's saying because of the troubled present, and because of the unsettled past, the letters are coming to his mind. It is returning back at leisure to knock at the door of his head, just like any churiwala who would come to Indian doors knocking in the um, day. But he is unable to write it down because of the trouble, because of the turbulence that is going in his mind in the present context and in the present scenario of India or Delhi. So he is troubled to distraction and there is no respite, I turn a page. The book lies open or remember drowning myself in the arms of that slut Johra Jan in an effort to blunt the pain. So what does the writer do? He is so full of pain that in order to uh, bury it, he takes all sorts of refuse and all sorts of things and uh, generally it is a tendency of human nature to move towards destruction or move towards you can say not right choices in life when there is some kind of trouble so because of all the trouble from the past what india has faced what delhi has faced and from because of the burden of the past which is troubling his mind today also plus the dust that is all course all around India so there is no way that India is uh, according to him or Delhi according to him is um, coming back to tracks but it is becoming more and more polluted so all these things are bringing to him distraction and uh, he tries to read he tries to open a page he turns the page uh, he tries to write down letters the letters keep knocking at, at his brain but again he is not able to pen them down very nicely. That's why he drowns himself in the arms of a prostitute. Maybe XYZ, whatever her name is, here he is choosing the name Johra Jan, just to blunt his pain, just to suppress his pain. So he is taking refuse in all sorts of flesh and pleasures and desires. That is the bent of modern civilization today. So again you see a hint of modern man when there are all drowned in flesh and desires, all full of passion, not understanding the real concern that they must be facing. So, how can anyone, I ask, forsake Delhi and its lanes? Nobody can be able to, again the question that in his mind is, that how can one leave Delhi? Although he is not happy with the place, the present scenario that is going on in Delhi, what the burdens of past have been levied upon Delhi, but still he says that he cannot forsake this place. Similar went of lines can be seen in Ezekiel when he says that island is the place. In, in his poem Island he says that Bombay is the place where he belongs. And although it is, uh, you can say, he describes hundreds of faults in Bombay, but then again he says that that is the place which he cannot forsake because he is the native who has been lived there for so long and he belongs to that place. So in the same way he is saying that whatever Delhi has become or has endured, still it is the place which one seeks refuse in and no one can forsake Delhi and its lanes. The Angrage impudently rubs salt in my wounds. Our pride bites the dust. Still palate the decrepit ruins. Now blood trickles down the Jamuna while the emperor flies indecisive kites or moans in verse his discomfort cure. Listen, Zok, after you, 
who is left to speak of Delhi? Question mark. So he's saying that when Angrej came, when colonial rule of Britishers came to India, whatever pride was left after the Mughals, after the Khiljis, Lodhis and Tughlaqs, whatever was left was also shunned down. They rubbed salt in our wounds. Already there were wounds from the earlier invasions, from the earlier rulers. Now, with the coming of British Empire, all those wounds were even rubbed more with salt. They were even aggravated more. The pride was battered down to dust. There was no pride left in us. And in these ruins of Delhi, what was left was just dust and the ruins. Blood was flowing all over in Jamuna. The river and the waters of Jamuna were all polluted because of the blood that was shed by our warriors, by our freedom fighters who were fighting for the independence of India in the British rule, British Empire. And what did the uh, current rulers do who were there at that time? So he is talking about the Mughal Empire emperors who were there at that time he is talking about Bahadur Shah Zafar and other such rulers who were in uh, at the time of British invasion that they were so much busy in flying kites and writing poetries because we all know that Bahadur Shah Zafar was a very good poet so they were drowning themselves saving the day by flying kites and by writing poetry not really looking into the matter how to save Delhi and only one, he says, was capable of bringing out what was really that was to be spoken up of Delhi. And that was the poet Zok. He mentions that after Zok, nobody was there who could talk about Delhi in such a precise way. Short of a ringing of neck, I try every trick of phrase to cosmetize the blank page. So again, he comes back to the blank page. He wants to write and he wants to decorate the page, cosmetize it, of course, to make it look beautiful, to make it more figurative, to make it more like a nice poem. So he tries all kinds of tricks and turns and all kinds of phrases that can make the poem more pleasing and appealing. And he's wringing his neck, of course, because of the pain of uh, scrouching down and writing and staring at the blank page and finding for or groping for more appropriate words and more appropriate ideas it refuses to improve it cannot improve it is not improving because you see the place that is talking about has been so much troubled for 800 years of bloodshed that uh, he is unable to portray it in a beautiful romantic manner whenever he will write the words will be rotten and sullen so the cosmetization can never take place that he is thinking about now i prefer to brazen speech knock the metaphor out of it so he says that there is no use of using metaphors there is no use of making it decorative there is no use of cosmetizing the poetry on delhi because of course the stabs have been so hard the bloodshed has been so brutal that uh, whenever he will talk about jamuna uh, he will talk about the bloodshed and the um, blood that has been flown into the rivers of yamuna and the 800 years of uh, uh, wounds that have been there and uh, that's why there is no beauty that can be created out of it there will always be lack of figurative language whenever he would be writing or talking about Delhi. And then he says that from all this, what saves him? A Brahmini kite preserves the afternoon as I write this. Near things distract me. So small, small things are distracting him. And that's why he is struck by the beauty of a flying kite the bird kite eagle like bird and uh, that kite uh, sways off his mind to something else and uh, the day is saved he is uh, 
focused off from what he was doing staring at his blank pages trying to find out words groping for words to write down his poetry and uh, his after his distraction he says what are the other things that is distracting me the lickspittle town its back street portrayed with empire kutub and purana kila scrap of paper blown about me day after day their distant tongue wraps my verse so he's saying that this town is a lickspittle town a town full of chamchas as you can say this is a town where whoever was in colon uh, whoever was in power whether it be it in the british empire rule or the moguls or even before people we indians forgetting our past forgetting our heritage forgetting our civilization and its rich cultural value went on to lick their feet went on to feed on their egos the egos of our masters who were manipulating us so this has been not only the fault of the outsiders and their invasions but it has also been the fault of the people who were here who were licking the feet of our masters as we called them who were licking the feet of the people in par and that's why this place is full of we can say the people who are chamchas who are and this town he is terming as the lickspittle town and all of our lanes all of our back street when we look towards our back is full with the rotten smell portrayed smell of the empire the empires that have been built in delhi it is signifying the monuments even like qutub minar or purana kila are also rotten according to him are also signifying the death and the distortions that were brought about by the manifestation of power that delhi has seen and scrap of paper blown about me day after day and that this is not one there are so many pages and pages of history that when you will turn over these scraps of pages you will see that the words will not come out of your mouth you will have to hold your tongue the distant tongue wraps my words the poetry that he is going to create is the ma- major flaw is that he is unable to pen it down why because when he thinks about all the past that has gone all the past that delhi has faced in the name of the outside invasions in the name of the uh, conquerors ruling here he says that there is nothing left for his tongue but just to hold it back and uh, there are eyes uh, there are dust thrown in his eyes because not only in his eyes he with his eyes he is trying to talk about all the people of india who were fooled by the people in par who were fooled by the incoming of the outsiders and their ruling the people of the indian ancient civilization so he is asking this question that because of the dust that had been thrown in our eyes we have forgotten our ancient history our past so he asks this question that will an indraprastha rise again because the ancient name of delhi was indraprastha the ancient culture which signifies at the time of uh, um, uh, like we can say centuries ago when uh, delhi was named as indraprastha when it was the most powerful of all the countries when people were attracted towards the vast power of uh, the country like india when uh, delhi was not delhi named by uh, some outside invaders but it was called indraprastha it was uh, compared to the heaven will that strata or will or will that stretcher of uh, delhi ever come back to life again the jamuna has forever covered its pores 
and what has jamuna been doing a river flowing on at the outskirts of delhi is actually carrying the burden carrying the burden of all the bloodshed that has been uh, flown in there and uh, then he has reached this age the author he says that life at 45 at the age of 45 years of age when he is writing this poetry is a breath of fresh air the children are grown up so for him as a person 45 years is a lot amount of time that he has lived the, he has completed most of his daily duties in his life the children have grown up all the burdens of his life have been sorted out their eyes hon my night i soften to the touch the wife keeps house so his all the daily matters have been sorted out and uh, he is still you can say that sleepless as nights why because of the tension that in his mind is about writing the poetry otherwise for the children they are grown up and uh, um, the wife is readily keeping the house the nights are actually being spent day by day in the tension of the children also somewhere or the other but the softness has increased in his mind because of the balance that he has attained in his personal life as a whole and uh, from afar shapes the poems till they become familiar as preya to be oneself stir no postures and when he looks at his personal life and he says that okay the children are grown up the wife is keeping taking care of the house everything is perfect around his house so somewhere or the other the poem is now ready to take the shape somewhere or the or the other now he thinks that uh, he is coming into the terms with what has happened in the historical context of delhi and it has become something which is now very familiar and it has become something of a prayer like thing uh, which is fixed which is there you have to say the daily prayers to be oneself what you are today and uh, you cannot pose there is no postures that you can stir up now because what has happened has happened and uh, whatever historical burden we have faced have faced so only thing that is left is to live in the present and when he sees his personal life and his present times he says that okay now this is the time when he can come into the terms with the living of the day to day life and i on rare occasions stumble upon the blessings of simplicity i couldn't ask for more so from coming to all the complexity of delhi from all the historical uh, things that have happened in the past in history and he trying to pen them down he trying to com- make a composition out of it compose it in a, it in a form of verse a form of poetry so tr- strong and potent and uh, full of metaphors and he failing at it and then he sees small things around him the flying of the kite the bird in the sky that he mentions and the children that have grown up and the beauty of his domestic life and the everyday prayer that he says which has become his you can say fixity in life so all these small things all these simplicities when he look to them towards them and when he stumbles upon them on occasions because he is focused more on the larger aspects so he comes to the personal and smaller aspects at a later time sometimes when he stumbles on them he thinks that there is blessing in this simplicity to be just confined to one's own bound boundary walls to the family boundary of his own and that is all that he wants one cannot ask for anything more so one has to come to terms with what has happened in the past one has to come to terms with what our historical burdens are and to sort them out and to be happy in your day to day life is what that really matters at the end of the day so coming from the 
larger complex things to smaller intricate details of his life the poetry closes so that was all about this poem and i'm sure you all have must understood it if yes then please don't forget to like share subscribe and comment thank you